Welcome everyone to Flagship Studios. Our guest today is founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering, Nubar Afayan, and CEO of Pfizer, Dr. Albert Borla. Dr. Borla took over Pfizer in 2019 and is largely known for innovation and culture at Pfizer, but also I think everyone in this audience probably has a combination of these two men to thank for the fact that we're here gathered in person and has medicines that you have innovated or partnered to create in your arms. So a quick thank you. And we'll invite you both to stage. Nubar. All right. OK, well, thanks, Albert, for agreeing to do this to kick off uh, the JP Morgan week. Uh, uh, so January 1, 2019, you stepped into this role, having spent a number of years in the animal health business, the human health business, and then eventually ascending to run all of Pfizer. Maybe just start out with sharing how the experiences you had before that role kind of prepared you for what would ultimately become probably an unexpected version of the role, but let's go back to 2019, January 1st. First of all, I want to thank you for the invitation and very nice meeting you all. I'm a great admirer of uh, the flagship concept and the flagship group of companies, and I'm a great admirer of you. Thank you. And uh, I think that in one of the companies that you have, which is Moderna, I admire competing with them because I found them formidable competitors, particularly knowing that their resources that they had were way smaller than our resources. Uh, but nevertheless, we are here now. And uh, look, I, I think that um, everything, that all experiences in my life made me who I am. And in that sense, they prepared me for the role that I had to do. I mean, uh, my marriage made me who I am. My kids influenced, my friends. My growing up in a, in a small country as a minority, by the way, a religious minority, not racial, but religious minority in this country, all of that created experiences. But clearly, within the job experiences, uh, you mentioned some of the most important things. One, it is that a very big part of my career at Pfizer was uh, in a poor relative type of department, the animal health. We were uh, the department that we always were around in error. And uh, as a result, we were left alone, but also were not given resources. So we learned to do things, although we're part of a big conglomerate, that uh, were less bureaucratic than uh, the things that uh, our brothers and sisters in the big department, the pharma, were doing. And uh, also, we had to learn how to navigate the system better than the others so that we can get some resources uh, that will come to us. I think that part of my experience helped me a lot. When I moved to pharma, to see things that people that grew up into pharma, they couldn't see. And uh, that helped me being relatively successful, more successful if I was growing within the ranks. And that helped me, I think, uh, a lot also get the job eventually. The other thing was that um, I had a very atypical career in terms that I relocated with Pfizer. Uh, we lived in uh, nine different cities of five different countries with, with uh, my wife and family. And uh, that gave me a very high appreciation of uh, the global nature uh, of, uh, of the business, that the differences of the different cultures, and how to appreciate uh, smaller but very strong cultures. Uh, those were the two things I think that uh, helped me the most when it comes to my career path. Super. So, so it's uh, January 1, 2019. You step into the role, some new elements of it, obviously, in scale and the totality of Pfizer. And then about a year later, everything changes. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that both everything and nothing can prepare you for a pandemic. Um, I'm reminded once in a while of the famous uh, quote by a surprising philosopher, Mike Tyson. He has this quote <laughs> that, that, basically, that basically says, plans are great until you get your first punch in the face. Uh, and, and, and that must have felt like that, because for all the plans people made going into 2020, all of a sudden, both the core business and the new opportunity totally threw that into disarray. Kind of maybe talk as a leader about that surprising development. So here you are waiting to kind of drive a big, you know, kind of resourced engine, and all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. I, I will uh, answer it, but two ways. One, um, 
the pandemic was a very unfortunate event for the world. Uh, but uh, in this uh, unfortunate, I think in Pfizer we were lucky that somehow we were preparing for it. What I want to say, when um, I took over in 19, I did a lot of changes in the company, not because I was smarter than my predecessor or now have a new sheriff in town. Actually, it's because of the good work of my predecessor. Mm -hmm. My predecessor was uh, dealing with a set of cards that were uh, not very good. Uh, decline and uh, R&D that was not productive. And he invested a lot of his time to try to build a better R&D machine. So when I took over, I felt that things have dramatically improved in the scientific capabilities of Pfizer. So I decided I'm going to bet the company on science. So we divested the first year 25% of our revenues that were not scientifically mm -hmm. driven. Consumer business, uh, of patent business. Then we became 25% smaller. At the same time, we in increased dramatically the R&D investments, dramatically the digital investments. And, uh, we decided that if we need to change the company, we need to create a culture that uh, can foster innovation within a very big conglomerate. And the culture we wanted to create was a culture of more scrappiness, uh, more courageous, make big decisions, right? So when the uh, pandemic hit, we were already mm -hmm. almost a year and a half in this journey. And uh, we found ourselves that we were preparing for that moment, how to have the courage to do things that others weren't able to do in the history mm. of science. And it worked out. Mm. So that, when it comes to Pfizer now, when it comes to pandemic and how it affected all of us, including uh, Pfizer and, and, uh, and uh, Flagship and Moderna and everyone else that uh, got involved into that. First of all, I think the world was seriously affected. Uh, I think uh, the family ties, the social uh, coherence were seriously tested. And I think we passed the test, actually, the society with flying colors. And I think we are uh, emerging better societies because of that. And that's a, a positive one. Um, although I think there will be some consequences down the road that we'll see people becoming way more introverts than they used to be because those two years staying home will not be without impact. We will see the impact. That's why I see it in myself. We are measuring ourselves in the surveys that we do, how introvert, extrovert I am. I was super extrovert. Mm. I became almost introvert. After We're trying to years. change that now. Now, <laughs> my interactions with you is bringing me b back to my good old Albert <laughs> that brings his wine together with... Uh, so that's the part of uh, the pandemic. But also how society or... The, the, there are three messages I think that stand out. <coughs> Three major uh, lessons. Two very positive, one very negative. That uh, came out, at least for me. And I'm thinking a lot about that. And th these are the real three that are coming to. The first is the power of science. I think it was demonstrated in the most um, dramatic way the value that a thriving life sciences ecosystem can play and can bring to society. Never again, never before, uh, we were able to demonstrate in that tangible way the value and the power of science that can change the root of history. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a very, very positive message and hopefully that will stay with us for, for the years to come. The second was the power of human ingenuity. I will uh, quote another philosopher, a little bit different, Aristoteles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, our problem is not that we aim too high and miss. Mm -hmm. Our problem is that we aim too low and hit, mm -hmm. which creates this culture of mediocrity, this, this culture of uh, uh, we are satisfied because we are very successful, although we are mediocre and you are successful by design. So when, what, at least for me, the lesson was that when you ask from your people to do the impossible, always there will be a first reaction that, that cannot be done. And they will try 
to spend a lot of energy. They spend a lot of energy to convince you that it's impossible to do it in eight months, what usually takes eight years. That's the first reaction. But if you don't release the pressure, the goal is the goal. It is eight months. You will be surprised mm -hmm. when they really get it that let's not waste time and try to convince him to lower the bar. Let's spend time trying to find the solution. You will be surprised how much they can achieve. This power of human ingenuity, again, in such a tangible way, saving the world, was amazing. Hmm. Now, the negative. <coughs> the situation that we, we lived, that um, misinformation and disinformation and politicization <coughs> of scientific debates created a situation that it is unbelievable damaging for concepts like the truth. And there is a truth. You can't say always that there is, a, uh, you know, there is a truth, depends how you see things. No, until now we knew that there is a scientific truth, right? That suddenly forces of evil were able <coughs> to emerge and utilize, weaponize that so that they can drive agendas that they are anti-systemic, anti-democracy, anti-whatever, anti-science, was amazing for me. Mm. And I never expected that we would reach that level. Mm. And I'm not speaking about <coughs> misinformation, right? Which is spread of wrong information, but could be innocent. I don't know, so I'm just speaking because I don't care, and then I say bullshit. I'm speaking about disinformation that intentionally you spread information that you know is wrong and you do it irrelevant of the harm that you know that you can cause because those few that they are doing that they know that they cause in life sir. but they do it because they have another agenda that's always malicious and it is amazing mm. how powerful became in our days mm. and the truth is that it was always powerful always used by evil it was disinformation that burned people in fires during the Inquisition, right? And uh, I said it multiple times that the Holocaust didn't start in Auschwitz. It started with the disinformation of the Nazis yeah. that prepared a whole nation like Germans to accept the most horrific crimes just because they prepared them with this well-orchestrated disinformation campaign, that they are evil, they do this, they drink blood of kids, they make vaccines that they are the worst enemy of society, etc. All of that back in 36, 37. So I think that was for me the very unfortunate moment of this pandemic. And you gave a talk about that recently <coughs> in the Defamation League. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the question that that begs is, what's the responsibility of the private sector? as well as the public, but let's say now we're talking as private sector, in dealing with this, because it could seem to be a political issue, and therefore if you kind of in the private sector, obviously one has to be careful about engaging in the politics of it, but if the politics means disinformation that hurts our patients, hurts our employees, then the question is how do you think about in the private sector engaging in this, and is our silence, relative silence in this regard, complicity? It's, a, it's an excellent question, and I don't think I have the right balance or the right answer. Where is the right balance? Um, in Pfizer, we tried to create a framework when we speak publicly and when we don't. And in, you know, in few words, when the issue is affecting health, our ability to innovate, so innovation policies about health, innovation, etc., we speak and we take position. We try to avoid when none of that are really affected. However, we had uh, Charlottesville, and we took a position. I don't think it was directly affecting the events, either health or our ability to innovate, but was affecting, let's say, our employees, the minorities employees that they felt that they need to hear the right message, right? Yeah. And uh, we, we did it again and again. So it's very difficult to find a line that you say, for that I speak, for that I don't. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, because I don't think it's the right way Right now, the credibility of business leaders is way higher yeah. with uh, social opinion than the credibility of politicians. 
and I'm sure they will wo work hard to discredit us, but uh, this is where we are right now. Yeah. I don't think it should be. I think in a w democratic society, it's not the CEOs of uh, yeah. Pfizer or of uh, Moderna or of, uh, I don't know, of IBM that should be moving the people in one or different direction. Are politicians that are elected by the people, but unfortunately, uh, they are not there, and there is a vacuum right now that yeah. business leaders are covering. Yeah. So coming back to the pandemic and then what that means going forward. So obviously, we call these things pandemics, and, and we really usually mean narrowly infectious disease, global. But if you kind of expand the definition to think about fast pandemics and slow pandemics, then diseases like obesity and diabetes and heart disease are every bit as much pandemics in the toll they take, global, universal, and, and yet we don't deal with them with the same, same sense of urgency as a fast pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, now you said, you know, we just lived through a, un, an unprecedented demonstration of the power of human ingenuity and science in solving problems in entirely unreasonable ways and entirely unreasonable time frames. How can we think about applying some of that to slow pandemics? Is that at all feasible? And what responsibility do we have internal to the R&D organizations to actually have them there? Now, on the one hand, uh, we worry that we're going to burn people out because they should now take their time developing drugs slowly because that was a real tough environment. But on the other hand, the patients that are losing their lives as a result now know better. So how do you, how do you manage that slow pandemic, fast pandemic, and the translatability of our experience? I think it's clearly if we could do it for COVID, why not for obesity, why not for cancer? These are questions that are in the, in the, in the mouth of everyone. And um, uh, the, the problem uh, is that um, from one hand we have a very big opportunity because we demonstrated that this can be done. And, but from the other hand, we demonstrate that this can only be done if we do things very differently. The companies that work and created all these, let's say, medical innovation in treatments or vaccines or whatever, in that short period of time, they were able to do it because they did things very, very differently. Regulators within FDA or EMA that uh, supervised this role, they were able to follow up on that crazy, let's say, speed because they did things very differently. And... Uh, one comes out and says, look what a great opportunity and victory. We demonstrated that if we do things differently, that's the way to work going forward. And it's not the case. Because both internally in corporations and yeah. in big organizations, the bureaucracy now is getting back uh, its uh, second life on defense and wants to say, no, 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 no. Instead of taking pride that look what you were able to achieve, they want to go and cancel everything they achieved and go back to the previous situation even more. And um, that's a problem. But nevertheless, I think it's so strong the demonstration of the impact that um, we will move in a positive way over there. Yeah. So despite this pushback, I think things will be better rather than uh, worse. And uh, the next wave, it is in all these slow pandemics that you mentioned including aging, which is the big mm -hmm. the demographic bomb. It's what I think is uh, representing right now the biggest threat to the global economies and to the global uh, societal cohesion. Because as people are living so long, they create tremendous burden, particularly to the high-income countries. And uh, they create tremendous burden for the families and tremendous burden for the system, the economics. And by the way, only with medical innovation that burden can be reduced. Unless if we change completely, as I said, our system and we don't care about the elderly, they can die, they can, uh, yeah. yeah. One thought, by the way, that comes to mind as you were speaking is, in a way, you know, the pandemic was such a tough period of time that, and afterwards with all the disinformation, it seems to have kind of been, you know, like almost like everybody wants to forget it. That part of the missed opportunity of forgetting it too quickly is to actually reward and celebrate the good things that came out of it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether some concerted effort 
to recognize the clinical development, the regulatory innovations that allowed this to happen. For that matter, including some of the government's involvement in helping facilitate getting such a program done, should be almost recognized by the private sector. Mm -hmm. So that we take the time to kind of say who at the FDA did these things and then acknowledge them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so because sometimes if you don't, like it's, it's, you know, it's like an opera, if you don't stop and applaud once in a while, it just ends and then that's it, you go home. I, I wonder whether we're kind of almost missing a moment to slow things down, not in development and regulatory, but in how quickly we forget the pandemic, because we forget the pandemic at our peril at some level. So the other thing that results from this, obviously, is that you, you mentioned this already, you innovated as a large company in a fairly unprecedented way. I mean, I, you know, I have publicly in interviews said that while obviously I take great pride in, in what Moderna was able to do, and that was you know, a, an overnight success 10 years in the making, uh, in the case of Pfizer, given the size, given all the other things kind of weighing on it, actually it's in a way a, a very different but equally impressive achievement because we had the advantage of agility, speed, desperation, all positive forces. And so how do you think about that beyond just slow pandemics on how to create a different mindset on innovation? I mean, how, how, does, how does that happen? Oh, it's everything that counts is a different mindset in the innovation. And clearly, the larger the organization, the more challenging it is to have innovation in the DNA. Because the larger organizations, they tend to go back to history, bureaucracy, rules, rather than uh, inspiration, uh, scrappiness, and all of that. And uh, it's not impossible, on the contrary. Uh, and there are companies that were able to, to do that at scale. But those companies are the $1 trillion market cap companies. Right? Who would say that Apple is not an innovative company? And who would say it's not small, but they are $1 trillion market cap? Who would say that Google is not? Who would say that Amazon is not? Who would say that Microsoft is not? They keep innovating, right? And they keep bringing new things in the world. And, uh, but there are few, right? There are only four or five trillion dollar companies right now. That can be done. And um, I think actually the next trillion dollar company will be a health company mm -hmm. in the world because it can. It is the time to utilize, let's say, both innovation, excuse me, both uh, uh, technology and understanding of biology and scale, the three of them, to create impact in a massive way. And there is nothing else more valuable in the world than uh, the health, right? Not only sentimentally, but it is 20% of the GDP. There is nothing that comes even close to that. So uh, you need a very different mindset, and it is difficult in big companies. In, particularly in Pfizer, we felt that uh, the key secret to innovation, given our history, <coughs> given where we go, the opportunities, were carrots. So we said that we, have the we have four values at Pfizer that were built based on what is the mindset we want to create in a company that wants to win in innovation. And the four were uh, carrots. The second was excellence. So you need to execute very well. The third were equity, particularly for a company that works in, uh, in the health. Trust is everything. And uh, you can't win the trust of, of the world unless you have in your DNA the equity in everything you do. Because otherwise you will make the mistake if you don't have it and you will recognize. And the fourth is joy. So which not only means that you know, people need to be cool and happy, and, but also they should take the joy and the pride of uh, having impact on other people's lives, which very few industries can claim. So the four of that we felt are the right recipe. So joy and pride, take pride. So work 24 hours to create medicines for people that they need it. And equity, make sure you think about when you do your pricing, it's easy you know, to have one price for all. It's more difficult to have different prices for different tiers of customers because we'll be criticized, but that's the right thing to do. Equity is not giving everyone the same. Equity is giving more to those that they need more. That's equity, right? Uh, so that's what we felt. And of course, courage, courage, because uh, you need 
to be bold. And uh, uh, innovation favors the bold. And uh, so that's how we saw it. Uh, in other companies, could be very much slightly different or very different. Because you need to see what is your starting point, when did you start, what is the current institutional memory of the company, what you need to change, and all of that. Uh, I think the four that we put down and we started working a lot helped us a lot to have the courage to do what we did, the ability to execute very well, uh, the way that we handle during pandemic our power, that was unlimited, frankly, and we were very, let's say, uh, decent and very, um, how to use, the modest, right, in, in the way that we were behaving rather than fanfare. And uh, this pride that drives an engagement at 96%, 96% of five. We have a survey at all 80,000 people of five. 96%. I feel very proud that I work with FISE. You can't achieve 96%, right? They are in an organization of yeah. 80,000, and we did. Great, fantastic. So, a couple of last questions. Um, and I was thinking about your comment about science and how much you had to go back and embrace science as one of the drivers for value creation. And I would observe, I'm curious what you're thinking, in, our, in this industry in particular, there has become over the last couple of decades an obsession around probabilizing every aspect of what is involved in R&D and ascribing preclinical probabilities, clinical probabilities. And, and in that framework, uh, I, I, would, I would contend that science is probabilized only as to its adjacencies. And so, you know, we have this word leap, which is obviously a big part of what we try to do. It's impossible to leap in a predictable way, saying, okay, you're gonna make a leap into the unknown, but tell me what probability you have of actually creating value. Uh, if you had ascribed the probability to the likelihood in eight months to develop a vaccine based on a technology that had never gone through three stages of clinical trials, it would have been very easy to say 1%, 3%, 5%, but those numbers would have been completely made up compared to what turned out to be 100%. You couldn't have said 100%, but there was no reason to put any other number on it because it was just unknown. So I wonder, kind of, because you've, you've obviously seen this kind of probabilized R&D management mindset, to what extent is that incompatible with unleashing science? It's to a very great extent. It is a necessary evil because you have to allocate capital and the scientific ideas are uh, unlimited. So people are coming with a lot of ideas. So you need to have a way, let's say, to try to, to to, to prioritize. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that um, most of our successes in history were not go back in every single product. Forget now the COVID, right? That would be 1% and 0% would be, right? And you would never do the investment based on the system. Repetor. Go to other blockbusters that happen. Nobody believed that mm -hmm. this will be this, uh, the value of these products. But they happen from accidents, most of them. Yeah. Or because someone really believed and despite the numbers, were, was able to carry on yeah. uh, the flame. Yeah. Uh, but, then, but then just like the pandemic, the next day we see that and then we go back to probabilizing and favoring the things that constantly. look like they're going to work. I agree. So anyway, that's it for another day. But I mean, this is what I was referring a little bit before we started. This interesting dichotomy between risk and uncertainty. Absolutely. That's yeah. what kills most of innovation. Exactly. I fully agree. But it would be interesting out of the pandemic to kind of start getting a language in the industry. And obviously we do this by necessity because that's what we do for a living. But for a large company like Pfizer to actually re you know, kind of state and realize that there has to be some zone where science can do its thing as opposed to be tamed to probabilizing uh, at, with the attendant lower expectations. So um, we're running short on time. So I want to actually end on one other thing where we have a, a common kind of experience. And, and certainly we've talked about this in the past it's affected each of our lives, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the degree to which you're coming from a small country, you mentioned in the beginning, uh, your minority status in that country, immigrating and the immigrant experience and the adversity. How do you find that has kind of shaped kind of how you do what you do? I don't mean who you are, because obviously you can't unbecome an immigrant, but, but to, to some extent, how, is that, how does that manifest in your professional life? 
first of all, impersonal and professional. I mean, we, we carry, again, our personality, our character. Now, I cannot claim that uh, because I'm Jewish, I was living in a country that were not anti-Semitics. Mm -hmm. Clearly, a minority is facing problems, but it's not the same like the problems that other minorities are facing in this country, or even worse, in some other countries, right? So clearly, I don't want to, 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 to claim any like that. But that sensitized me right, to what it is to be minority. And uh, the same is with immigration. Um, the, when I see my leadership team, I'm Greek. The head of HR is for Afghanistan. My head of innovation is from uh, uh, Tanzania. Uh, the head of commercial is from South Africa. Uh, and I can go on on. The head of research is from Sweden, right? I can, I can go on and on. I mean, we are the clear demonstration of the power of immigration and what can create. And this country is the clear demonstration of the power of immigration and what can create. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, it's like it doesn't want to progress the country. Uh, uh, there's so much political debate that is blocking even further immigration that only good can do to all because this country really needs people to come and work. And also the way that they treat minorities here, which in some places is completely <coughs> unacceptable. Right? And uh, that, again, slows down the economy and slows down everything in the country. So. Uh, it's a wonderful country, the country we live. I'm so proud. I, you know, I'm Greek by birth, American by choice, exactly. I say. And I made that choice because I felt all the greatness that this country has. But we have some issues. And immigration and anti-immigration is one of them. <laughs> Although immigration is what created this country. Well, look, thanks for, for uh, sharing these thoughts and, and thanks for being our inaugural guest. Now, clearly, kind of beginning of 2023 is either the beginning of a great new era following the pandemic for, for all of us, or obviously with some fits and starts. But I think the, the inherent optimism <coughs> and dedication that you're coming across with is, should be an example for everybody. So thanks again. For no, that. thank you for having here. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good.